Hello, everyone. My name is Julie McVeigh, and this is Unordinary Made Ordinary, where we talk about the extraordinary experiences of everyday people. And today, our guest is Jennifer Schaefer. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Julie. Thank you so much. I love it. I love the title of your podcast, too. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very excited about this interview. My sister has been doing most of the interviews the last few months since I've been so busy, but uh, just the two of us today. So <laughs> yay. So we're just gonna dig right in because uh, we have just about maybe an hour. And what I'd like to do first, if it's okay with you, is if you could just share a little bit about yourself, a little background on who is Jennifer. Hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm married with two children here in Manhattan Beach. And I've had a private practice as a psychic medium, but I just call myself an intuitive for the last 10 years. And um, I'm actually known for uh, helping with cases, working with law enforcement. And so I work with the dark web division of the FBI. I work with various law enforcement agencies all throughout the world. And I also help a lot of families that have unresolved uh, questions about the dust in their family or missing persons. But my private practice and where you met me, which was a lot of fun, I love to do events. And I donate a lot of time to charity with those events. Um, wine and spirits, something a little, you know, I thought it was kind of funny having wine and then spirits. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, I love it. Yeah. And that just gives a different take. It's just a little bit lighter, you know? Mm -hmm. Um and before that, I was a stockbroker for 10 years. Hmm. Yeah, in my 20s, I got at 19, I was a stockbroker and did that for 10 years, met my husband, went back to school. Um, I couldn't go back to school when I became a stockbroker because I was making too much. <laughs> like, didn't make sense to go back to school then. But my husband's like, um, okay, if you're going to have a nanny, he's like, you got to do something <laughs> besides going to Beverly Hills or something stupid like that. <laughs> and so I went back to school and I loved it. I went to LMU, which was a lot of fun. And then I just wanted to figure this out. It wasn't anything that, um, I didn't know I had it as a stockbroker, but looking back, I, now I know, I knew everything about my clients. I knew everything about, you know, everything. I just didn't have a context to understand it. Wow. Yeah. I would are, think that would be helpful in that line of business. Can you imagine? Yeah. But I didn't know. And I think it was a blessing that I didn't know because mm -hmm. there's, too, there's probably too much pressure when you're dealing with that. You know, I just thought it was my intuition. Clients have bought houses because they invested in Apple. You know, I mean, they, I did that back in the nineties. You know, I told my clients to invest in Apple. And so between that and a bunch of other stocks, they were I still get thank yous for that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, so, so did you have any experiences as a child that you look back now? And go, oh, when I was five. Yeah. So I knew things. I Well, first of all, the thing that got me the most was the fact that I always see things going around. But the, again, there was no context to what it was. I was raised in a very religious family, a Mormon family. I'm one of seven children. I had seizures as a little kid, grandma's larynx strider seizures as a little kid. And my mom finally got me into the um, hospital where it was still happening to me because she kept bringing me in and it was already gone. And they're like, you're kind of crazy. Finally, she brought me in and it was still happening. And there was a British doctor on staff that said he saw this before. They fed me belladonna, which is a hallucinogenic and a poison. So, mm. and eventually I grew out of it. It actually saved me. But to give a three and a half month old, could you imagine a hallucinogenic and a poison was just crazy. And, but it worked and, but they believe, so the reason why I explained that story is because they believe that was the gateway for this. Everyone oh. has it, but they actually believe that that was, they've studied my, my brain. And so they actually believe that was the gateway it was from my childhood. Yeah. Oh, so who, so where did you go to have your brain studied? Oh, I, the neurologist. I've had several neurologists that have done that. I've had CAT scans. I've had MRIs. You know, they're when you were a child. I'm assuming. No, now. And when oh, I was, no. yeah, now oh. they played. Looking back at my medical history, that that was it. Um, I also had a severe bicycling accident that they think that might have catapulted that as well, where I broke 
seven, I broke eight bones in my face. Um, I was a professional triathlete when I was a stockbroker. Apparently I couldn't run far enough away from myself. So um, that kind of did, they believe, you know, head trauma can cause that as well. So between both of the accidents, they think that was the gateway for this. Wow. But, yeah. But I always saw things when I was young. So I always saw spirit, but I was, you know, I just thought everybody did. I wanted glasses and I was the only child out of all of us, out of all seven children that had 20, 20 vision. Nobody else did. I know. My so no one else saw the, the spirits. Just no. you and mom and dad didn't, they don't have a background in that. And no, my mom has a very strong sense of intuition. She has the mother's intuition. That's, you know, very, very strong to keep all of us alive. But um, that's just all she called it, you know? Yeah. Were they religious or they did, did they very, raise you? Very. I went to seminary at 6 a.m. for all four years of high school. Yeah. Okay. And how did that play in with, as you transitioned from religion to this, how you difficult was it? It was so difficult. I think anything that you're really supposed to do, you know, you're going to have resistance. And mine was guilt because I left the Mormon church and I love my parents and my dad, you know, my dad who's in spirit. I was fortunate enough that he actually understood what I did for work before he passed. And he oh. loved what I did for work. He called me a good Samaritan. And so he loved what I did for work. And um, he really just, he's just like, how can I get mad at you when you donate, you know, you donate 30 to 40% of your work to families in need, to law enforcement. And he's just like, he goes, you don't do it for any other reason. And so um, it was very interesting. And he watched me do it. He was at my house for three days and watched me work on several huge cases. And I put it on speakerphone and he got to listen. And he's like, how do you know what they're looking at? How do you know these things? And I'm like, it's just the difference of being on a phone. Is, I always say this, I'm like when you're calling somebody and they're describing this, this guy that they're madly in love with and you get this sick feeling, you're like, oh, and I'll get pictures, I'll get feelings, I'll get everything. The only difference is I know that it's being given to me. It's not something I'm thinking, right? That's all it is with conversations. So I know that when I look at somebody or when I'm talking to them, I know that I'm being given information right and left. I'm not thinking it. So sense? would you consider your dad now your guide or, you know, or one of your guides? Yeah, it was very challenging because for some reason I thought I could save them. You know, I have that enormous guilt because I tell people if they have I'm a medical intuitive. So I tell people if they have cancer, I'll tell them, hey, this is what's going to happen. You need to get checked out. And I told my dad to go into the hospital and they said they actually treated him for something else because um, he was in Cozumel. And then I let it go. And so part of me, I don't, I know I couldn't have saved him, but I had this enormous guilt. And whenever you have guilt around anything, you can't get information. Mm -hmm. you have projections, if you have fear, if you have guilt, you can't get the right information. Your mm -hmm. mind rules anything that can come in well i have heard that it's harder for mediums to read their family i don't know maybe that's related to what you're sharing here yeah it it is very hard because it you have an attachment to the outcome you know i didn't want my dad to have cancer so of course i'm like no my grandmother told me three months prior when i was um actually i, I was in a meditation and i she's just like your dad has cancer. And that was his mom. I'm like, no, 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 no. He's just sick from Cosimo. And the second you also decide something, then that goes away. So I never heard it again. Uh, yeah, I see. You know? So, so when was your, like your big breakthrough or like when you, like, when did the stall all start falling into place? Like, oh, okay, I need to start reading people. I'm so <laughs> well, it was a long, long process, but a neighbor down the street who I've never met died suddenly in the middle of the night. And I got every single thing that happened to him that night. And I was freaking out. And, he, and, and to the point where I knew his wife was going to come to me a month later and everything happened the exact way that he brought it to me. And so I'm like, okay, I just need to figure this out. I never thought I'd do it for work ever. That was never even a question, but I also didn't want to stick with the information that I had. 
that's it becomes toxic. And so I'm like, I have to figure it out. And so I reached out and eventually I eventually Lisa Williams took me underneath her wing and really guided me and helped me. And she even sent me my first client. So my first paying client, she goes, you have to charge. I'm like, what? But I, but I had some really good advice. In fact, from my office mate, Denise McDermott, she said, you know, she's just like, you're an intuitive. She goes, you know, you've done the residency because I did, I did this for three years without charging anything and do it in exchange for like a book or a notebook or a candle. And she's like, that's like a medical, you know, medical res residency. She was like, you're ready to go, you sure. know, figure it out. And I did. And it's been, if I can make this normal for somebody else, just like you're making me normal in your podcast, right? I look at this as the new normal. Everybody has intuition mm -hmm. and it is a muscle. So if you want to get in shape, you do all these exercises, you eat right, you do everything. Well, if you want to strengthen your pineal gland, mm -hmm. Start, you have to start listening to what's being given to you. Mm -hmm. So you do believe, because I was wondering, because you had some medical situations that sort of helped this along, but you feel that anyone could sort of develop this ability. Absolutely. I think anyone could develop the ability for themselves. I'm not sure if they can, they even want to go around reading people or if they see dead right. people. Like I do. Sure, yeah. <laughs> I, I think the only reason why I was given that ability whether I charted it before I came or who knows is because of the fact I probably wouldn't have believed it if I didn't physically see it, but physically seeing it drove me absolutely crazy. I'm like, it's not mm. going to work. all these things that are floating around. I remember hating taking naps when I was a kid, couldn't take naps because it was just so, it was just, you know, during the day I'd see them floating around. It was just the weirdest thing. So do you still see similar manifestations? Like, is, is it like a face and a body, a, a translucent it's a, it's a face but i'll see a whole outline you know so in my bedroom like there's a there's this long hallway that goes to the kitchen and at nighttime especially during a full moon if my door is open i'll see full-on apparitions coming towards me and it you know i've just had had to learn that nothing can hurt me there's nothing bad like nobody bad can hang out with me my energy won't allow it neither will my guides neither will anything um and I just had to calm myself down from it. Like, cause it's, it is kind of scary at first. Well, I was a child, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. But nothing, nothing, so nothing negative really has ever happened to you through childhood with the spirits? Um, no, not through the spirits, not at all, nothing. But seeing the future did, it kind of, that's always been. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to share or can you share any more of like profound, amazing experiences with working with whomever you've worked with that you found like, oh, this one is unbelievable. I have to share this. <laughs> this is, there's a couple, I have several, but I'll share with you one of the ones that, um, so I usually get a call right before the FBI goes in and makes a bust. And mind you, they've been working on cases that, you know, if they surveillance somebody, it's usually like they'll surveillance somebody for like a year, sometimes a year and a half before they go in. So they'll call me and I will prep them for what they're going to, what's going to happen when they go in. That's all I do is I prep them. Okay. And this, this time it was pretty, pretty interesting. And they all know how I work. They're wonderful human beings. They're amazing at what they do with, for work. But I'm like, the biggest thing is helping them make sure they don't get fentanyl on them because they, when they bust someone, they don't send in dogs. They send in the hazmat team later, but they don't send, they go in and bust the person. When you're dealing with somebody that's, that is, you know, a drug runner or is dealing with, you know, drugs, um, it kind of gets a little scary plus the guns and everything else. But anyway, so I told them, I said, okay, I use the house that you're looking at. And what I do is I just remote view through them. I'm like, okay, you're going to okay. go through that. And they say, yes. I'm like, you're going to go up a couple of stairs. Yes. I'm like, keep getting dogs. I keep getting two bulldogs. I'm like, Jen, we've been surveillancing this house for a year and a half. There's no bulldogs. There's nothing. I'm like, okay, it could be a name. And there's, there's a reason why I'm telling you the story. It could be a name. It could be a, a street name. It could be somebody that they're in contact with. And we'll just remember. And like, you got to look up, like there's something about if you see two bulldogs, like look around. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. I'm like, and then I'm like, okay, there's stuff that's in the ground. I'm like, yeah, I think he's hiding money in the ground or pot in the ground. I'm like, and don't touch the shed because I felt like there was fentanyl on the shed door. 
And so they made the bust. They went in there and they called me. You're not going to believe this. They're like, we went upstairs to his bedroom. They're like, his bed, his bed, his bedspread had two French bulldogs on it. So oh, like, okay. Oh my God. Just, just you know, the bedspread did not the actual bulldogs, but the, just the yeah, bedspread. Yeah. They looked right. up. All of the stuff was above them. Ah, okay. Yep. Wow, that's cool. cool. But it's interpretation. So there's a lot of stuff that I get that it could be interpretation. Like another case that I I think I've mentioned this before just a long time ago, but I worked on a case where I was there was literally like eight FBI agents, two DEA agents. It was a huge case. This girl went missing, and this was in Orange County. And we're trying to figure out what airport because I'm like I feel like it's by an airport, but at before we got off the phone, I said to him, I said, you know what, where's the mom? And the mom was on the phone call because they were all together and I was just on the phone. And this is one that my dad was listening in on. And I said to him, I said, you know what? Um, don't, I'm like, you go walking at night, right? And she goes, yeah. I'm like, don't go walking. I'm like, well, walking around feels deadly to me. Like, don't go walking. There's something about walking. Well, the next day I led them through an airport. We figured out which airport. There was like three. I led them through an airport they called me up because I didn't know if she was in a shed or if she was in this place that was across because I was getting the view that it was across these two, these two lanes. It was like a two lane airport, like a two uh, runway, but there's only two runways. Mm -hmm. And they're like, you're not going to believe this. They're like, guess what the house is? Guess what street it's on? Walking street. Oh, they got the warrants. They busted down the door. Unfortunately, they found her DNA, but not her body. But it was like one of those things. It was just, and I was devastated. I was wow. completely devastated. But um, you know, it's it again. It goes back to interpretation. But when you're doing it enough, yeah. you can feel it. You know, you can actually um, make it to where uh, you'll end up working it out. And sometimes you just don't have to know. I my biggest thing is to get in and get out because otherwise they get emotionally tied to it. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, you said you do remote viewing. So it's not just seeing spirits or hearing from them, but you you do the remote viewing and that's different. How, would you know how to describe that um, versus astral projection? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, astral projection is just, I do that when I go see what my kids are doing. I can focus in and go find my daughter at school. I used to do that when they were growing up. You know, at one point I felt her crying. So I went to go look for her where I projected myself there. And the teachers knew what I did for work. And I'm like, I texted the teacher and sure enough, she fell and she was crying. Okay. You know, people don't realize they think that they're thinking it. You can actually go in there and see it. The difference between astral projection and remote viewing or what I do um, is like, for instance, last night I read 22, I don't know, I read a lot of people. And one of the people that I read last night at Uncorked in Manhattan Beach, um, oh. I said to him, I'm like, okay, I'm going through your house. I'm like, your house, I'm going through the front door. And she's right in front of me, but I'm telling her exactly what's going on in her house. And it was her dad showing me this time. But whether he was showing me or whether I was doing it, I'm like, I'm like, I'm going through your house. I make a right. I'm like, I have to go up a couple more stairs. I'm like, wow, he just took me to the roof. He says, thank you. And she was a skeptic. She goes, what? She's like, we just redid the whole roof. Like she just couldn't believe it, but he took me through the house to figure it out what it was, you know? It's just, and this is her father who had passed on. Her father who passed on, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, and so it, are you able to contact like any kind of figure like Einstein, <clears throat> Elvis, Jesus, or do you, can you only connect with uh, loved ones or somebody that you're connecting with somebody who knew them? You know what I mean? So um, I do this podcast with Richard Martini once a week and we talk, we've talked to Elvis. We've talked to, okay. you, we've talked to him. There has been, and he, to the point where he, cause he knows a lot of people in old Hollywood. And so he knows a lot of people that are up there. He has somebody that it's like a class that's up there and it has princes in it. Robin Williams I've talked to. So for instance, I've talked to Steve Jobs several times. I've also talked to um, Kobe oh. Bryant. And those families have actually found me irrespective of me talking to him before, like his daughter showed up, his daughter ended up and she won't mind me saying this. So Steve Jobs' daughter booked an appointment with me last year. She's a client of mine now, but she booked an appointment and Whoa. that day I'm like, I'm like, you got to show him, well, Steve, if it's really you, because even then I'm like, really, you know, is this really, 
because I just get a name, Eve Jobs. I'm like, is this really your daughter? And then, so even wow. then, I'm like, give me a sign. And later on that day, I was talking to another client of mine. And then the person that was deceased said to me, hey, ask her what she's looking at. I'm like, I told Sandy, I'm like, what are you looking at, Sandy? And she goes, oh, I'm looking at a picture of Eddie and I. I'm like, can you tell me what it's about? And she goes, he was actually the partner, business partner. He was the actor in Steve Jobs, the movie. That happened that same uh-huh. day. And I'm like, okay, that's all I needed. And then when I got on the phone with Eve, I'm like, Eve, can we just get this? She goes, yes, that's my dad. Steve is my dad. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, I didn't want to say, I see an apple. I'm on, you know, a Macintosh. <laughs> I was kidding around making fun of it. But it so was- I, I, I've talked to someone who believes that she's in a trans dimensional relationship with Steve Jobs. Coincidentally, I just mentioned this to a friend yesterday. So now we're talking about Steve Jobs again, or maybe I mentioned it today. But anyway, um, yeah, it was today. So <laughs> no this is probably controversial, but to do when you cross over, is it are relationships different? Like if you have a married partner still back here, is it okay to hook up with someone else on the other side or a living person on this side? I mean, how does that work? Are the rules different? You know what? I don't necessarily know what the rules are, but I do know how loved we are by the other side. And I do know it's different. Um, that's interesting. I don't, I've never heard of a trans, you know, what is it called? Uh, I, 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 she's alive here. Right. And she's in communication with Steve over there. And they hook up astrally. Like they hang out and they have a relationship and they talk and, and it's like, that's really? I don't know what to make of that. I think anything is possible. I don't know. I haven't done it myself, but I have seen, you know, I have seen in dreams. I've met, you know, I've seen my dad in a dream where we were dancing, you know, but I haven't had necessarily a relationship with somebody over there, I guess. So I don't know. Yeah. On this channel, we have um, some interviews of um, spouses who are still living and they are in a relationship with their spouse on the other side they do not consider themselves divorced or widowed or whatever absolutely I've seen that many times many times I think it's the greatest thing ever that they're able to communicate and still have that relationship it just looks a little bit different you know yeah I always wonder um how some people they have this really strong connection with their loved one and others all they get is a feather or their electronics go on and off, or they see butterflies or something. And I wonder what is, what is stopping either us or them from really having a, just a one-on-one dialogue? That is a wonderful, that's a wonderful question. I think a lot of it has to do with grief. So if you're, if you are mourning over this person, it's a lot more challenging to get information um, and to have that dialogue. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of people that die of cancer, that their spouses that are close to their spouse and their spouse is taking care of them, that they actually, they actually make sure that they know that, you know, a lot of times they tell, you know, they plan their afterlife. So they're like, okay, I'm going over to this side, but we're still, I'm still going to communicate to you every day. And you have to believe it. And I think just prepping the person that's here before Mm. you does wonders does everything you know and there's some people that just a lot of it has to do with what you believe like if you don't believe it then the universe lets you have it it doesn't discriminate so if you don't like I can't tell you how that screwed up so many things for me you know um, if I didn't believe a way a certain person died or if I didn't believe something then they can't show that to me again and it takes Mm. them 10 times as long to get me to the same conclusion it's just Mm. a Especially with belief cases. systems, very powerful. Sounds like very powerful. So, uh, so after you cross over, do belief systems also have such power? For example, I've heard that when Christians cross over, they go to a Christian heaven, and when you know uh, Hindus cross over, they go to a Hinduish kind of place or Buddhist. Do we have these manifestations, heavenly manifestations, based on our belief system? I think whatever makes them happy. So it's. Um, I do believe that, you know, I think that if you, if that's what you believe and you leave, you know, people see Jesus or people see the Buddha or people, yeah, it's whatever your belief system is. I think it's more of an energy 
that you get connected with versus an actual person, but that's just my belief. I don't think God necessarily is this white guy in the sky. I just don't believe in that, but I know there's a definite higher power. There is a God, but it's just not what we think it is. Does that make sense? Oh. Um, yes, I would. That was one of my questions is how would you, after all these years of experience and speaking to those on the other side, if, how would you describe God or ultimate the source? Highest, I think God is the highest source of love that there is. I think God is love and I think love is God. I think it's within all of us. And I think that the more that we can love ourselves, the closer we get to that. And the more that we love others, the closer we get to that. I think judgment from judgment of ourselves and of others keeps us away from that. I think, which causes, you know, when you feel like you're not doing the right things and you belong to a church, what does that do? It separates you, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it, I think it's great for people that can go to church and still be spiritual too, take all the good things that come from it and leave the rest that they might not use. But I think it's really challenging because it's, it's in our, it's human nature to want to be the best at whatever it is we do, right? Including that. And, you, and some people just feel like they can't do that. I think that just comes with time. I'm sorry. I just didn't mean to go down a rabbit hole. But I no, do. Like no, that's fine. I, I was wondering love. if you have had a chance to talk to Jesus and if he's like, hey, you really messed up what I was saying, but it's cool. Or like, do you have any input on that? <laughs> I've actually, there's a book out actually that quotes me in it. Um, I have like the first time that I felt him, I couldn't take it. I started bawling. It was a weird phenomena actually. And he didn't show up. Like he showed up in a pair of jeans and a shirt, um, a blue button down shirt. It wasn't like the way that people think. And he never wanted anything to be like the way people view him. And I do believe he is up one of the like ascended master or yeah, with would you describe just somebody that has such a knowing of love and such a compat like so much compassion that if we could carry an ounce of that we could change the world ourselves you know um yeah it's interesting there's a lot of I think everybody has can have their own pers personal relationship with them they can have their own personal relationship with whoever they want over there, if it helps. And if reincarnation is a real, part of our reality, does that mean Jesus has reincarnated or is done with his reincarnations here? So I, what I believe is that if we take the ocean and the ocean is our soul and each wave is a different time period, it's a different version of ourself, but we go back to the soul we still keep that individual wave part. We still are that individual wave. So when I leave this planet, I mean, I think that there's lots of me's elsewhere that have reincarnated, you know, but we get to go back to the soul and we get to have all that knowledge of where we've been, who we've been with, you know, that kind of thing. You know, who's mm -hmm. to say that Steve wasn't with that person that he's having that relationship with in a different lifetime? Maybe she mm -hmm. just recognizes them from this lifetime, even if she's never met him. You know, I don't know. Okay. I think, I mean, if you go, so when you go to the other side, you're able to look. You, past, present, future, from my understanding, shows up in the same place. And so you're able to look at your past, present, and future all at once. It's a weird phenomenon from where you're at, right? So I'm just saying, yes, you, the version of yourself here is going to stay that way. It's going to go somewhere. It's going to stay that way, but go up to your soul. Okay. It sounds like I've heard the concept of soul group or, or coll soul collective. And, and like what you were saying, you, your identity, Jennifer goes there and she doesn't lose her identity, but she's also, are, are you also able to tap into all of your other yes. selves, yes. like sort of plug in and, and, and see life through your other selves? I think we have, I mean, I think I've tapped into it here. I think I'm, I've tapped into a lot of different parts of myself, versions of myself, some that are not that pretty. I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about mentally. Okay. You know, I'm, I was scared to death of flying. Like every time I got on a plane, I said goodbye to people. It was just one of these mental goodbyes. Like, did I do everything right? Is everything going to be okay? It was weird. And ever since I had 
kind of like a regression, uh, past life regression, it's gone now. I don't have that fear anymore, but I definitely, cause I died as, I mean, I was obsessed with pilots when I was growing up, obsessed with like, I don't know. It was just a weird thing. And I had, um, I was a, I was a pilot that, that was in the war and mm. died in the war. Yeah. Whether that happened or not, it erased whatever it was that made me have fear. You know? So the soul collective, would that include your uh, incarnations on other planets? You know, can you tap into your ET lives as well? I haven't, but yes, you can. I believe you can. I actually, I have once. Yes, I have. Yeah. Yeah, I have once. I think I did with you my- You want to share? You don't have to. But do you want to yeah, share? I just, I always have seen myself out in the future. I think I'm a, you know, one of those, um, what do you want to call it? I can't believe I can't think of it right now. Um, I'm like a star flower. I don't know how else to call it, a star seed. I call it a star flower. Um, yes, yes. Right? And so I know that I've, I know I've had a past life with Lemuria, the Atlantis. I, I, I mean, I've had some incredible different, you know, was between that and as well as all my dreams have been in the future, which is also really weird too. So I know, I feel like, you know, I kind of, I'm normal, but not normal here, I guess you can say. Um, I, do, I am wondering, it's kind of a hard question and it's okay if you don't really feel comfortable answering, but when we were talking before about God and love, um, I was wondering what you think suffering, how, cruelty and suffering, what place do those kinds of things have here? Why would we need to incarnate on a planet with such extremes? Because um, I'm sure there are other planets that are maybe less cruel, more love, more light. I think this is the one planet out of a gazillion, the one planet that I'm aware of, that we get to come in here. There are trillions of souls that would love to come in here because a day here is like being somewhere else for 500 years. It can, I, let me try to explain it. Um, so the suffering, that it, let's go back to the suffering. Like I had to learn how to not have judgment, remember? Because if I have judgment when I go into a case, then I don't get the right information. It took a shaman the last 10 years helping me work this out where I had to get into a place where there is no good or bad. I had to get into that place. And then let me explain to you how that happened. He told me, he goes, you're not God. I'm like, I never said I was. What are you talking about? He goes, then why are you judging? Why do you feel like you have to punish someone? Or why do you feel like that person... He goes, what if you knew there was an equalizer out there? It just might not be on this timeline. And I thought about it. What if, you know, he goes, it's not your job to know if that person is going to be punished. It's your job to give information, get out and not get sucked into it. And for some reason, just knowing that there is some type of equalization out there made me feel so much better. And so for instance, like somebody that has, you know, I used to get just gut wrenched when I saw a homeless person. I still do, but it, I have a different take on it. What if that person was royalty in his past life and wanted to learn about this? Like we take, I believe we take different turns in who we are. We have similar threads throughout each turn, but we take different turns in who we are throughout this. Um, I had a past life where I actually was the one that condemned witches. I said, forget it. I'm tired of being killed for what I'm doing. I'm going to be the person that does it. I want to see what that's like. That was the ugliest lifetime I've ever seen in my life. The worst. But I think we come to do different, we do different things with different times. Can I prove this? No, I can't. That's the part that's frustrating. But I know deep down inside, I have, I kind of believe what I found or what I saw you know, in a past life regression with that, that resonated. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't even know if that answered your question. It helped me knowing that there's an equalizer out there and whether you call it God or not. Karma, you, some people might call it, call it karma, I yeah. suppose. I think that whatever you do here, you bring back. So if you're not doing something nice, it's gonna come back to you because it's gonna attract that energy. It just does. 
And so, so if we take the energy that we've experienced on this planet, if we do incarnate on another planet, we it's the same energy we're taking over there. But what if our energy I don't doesn't match that. that planet? Yeah, I don't think we do. I think we create our oh. karma here. So I think we create our karma that we do here. I know that once we leave, we go to the energy that we're resonating with. So that's why no one bad can come in or whatever. And again, there's no bad, but no one that doesn't fit my energy can come into me. Can come, mm -hmm. I can come in and I don't have to be worried. And I believe me, I got worried because I'm looking at murderers. I'm looking at people that have been killed, people that have killed people that are over there. Like that, it took its toll on me for a while until I figured it out. They can't come in. I can see them from afar, but they can't come in. Like nobody bad can come in and give me information that's actually helping people. Nobody's going to do that anyway. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because a lot of people have like, like, where is this coming from? Where are you getting this information? You know, is it from the dark side? No, it's not. <laughs> So the soul collectives are the, are, are, would you, is that our higher self, by the way, the soul collective is a higher self, or do we each individually, we each Julie individually. Jennifer has a higher self? We each individually have a higher self, I believe. Okay, so we each individually have a higher self, and then we go back to the soul collective, are we connect, reunited with our higher self, and that's what kind of goes back in with the soul, soul group? I think, I think our higher self, I mean, if, if you think about it in the context of I actually believe this is like a coffee stop for us. It's a short, short time period of us coming in here, even though it feels long, it's a, it's, it's very short. So uh, there's a point to that. Um, when you go back, so your higher selves, when they look at us like, oh, look at, she got a little divorce, the poor little girl. Like our higher selves think of us like that when we're going through a traumatic experience, right? Yes, they're with all of our, there our higher selves are with our collective souls so like my daughter's soul like our higher selves i'm sure are all talking to each other they're making coincidences happen along with other you know other spirits um what was your question again i apologize i'm sorry it's okay i'm just trying to like you know make sense of the how it's all related the higher i wasn't sure if we consider if you consider the collective soul group the higher self but you're saying no no no. there are, there are many higher selves in the soul group right and so is it are we like what's the purpose of this are we is the soul group evolving or is it just merely for entertainment or like is there a what's the bit of both. i think it's both? really to feel like it's occurred to me that i think when you get up to the when you leave this planet I think the questions are not what you did wrong. They're like, did you love well? Did you live well? Did you love well? You know, there's people in India that don't have anything that are living one that love to live. You know, it's a matter of, it's a matter of who, like nobody on the other side has ever said, I wish I would have held back. Like, did you waste time in your head? Did you waste time? not stepping out and be and being who you are you know what i mean we i think all of us have just different missions when we come here and we just we're passing the baton to ourselves over and over and over again to see if we can do better some say and it may be incorrect information but some say that life over there in the afterlife is really quite similar to this life. Like you could have jobs, you sleep, you eat, you have sex, you know, how much of, of that is, rings true for you? I, you can do all of that. You can manifest all of it. I have never seen anyone sleep over there ever. You know, when they say, oh, you, when you're dead, you could sleep. No, no one ever, no one sleeps first and foremost. Secondly, I believe you can manifest things instantly like you have a geometric there's geometric patterns that you can like if you want to taste mustard you can you can make that happen but it's just different the difference here is this the surprise the difference here is the laughter and the love and the hugging and the kissing you can recreate that i'm sure over there there's no question about it but is it fun to recreate it or is it fun to be in it you want to be in it and that's what we're here for you want to be in like and what I'm saying is, 
the sex over there is not like the sex here because we have our bodies. They do not have their bodies, but they can re recreate an experience if they'd like. Okay, so they don't manifest bodies over there and then recreate the experience. They just simply recreate the experience. They, re they can recreate the experience with their, so I don't know if it's mind sex, I don't know. They can recreate the experience. The, the one, dif the difference that I know of is they don't have their bodies, we do. And we oh. have the element of surprise. So, okay. so, they, so and ahead. I know you're just, you're just going off, you know, what you know right. and interpret and interpreting it. Yes. And it's not something that it's just my years of studying the other side and listening to the other side to have them. So like to have them like want to wring people's necks when they want to come in saying, Oh my goodness, like go use your body, go have fun, stop it. You know, you guys have so much here and you don't even know it, the good and the bad. I think it's a play. Wouldn't you want your play here to be vibrant and fun and have some loss and have some good times? You wouldn't want a boring play, right? You'd want it to be. No, so but I mean, I'm really, I personally, my personal thing is I'm hung up, unfortunately, on all the suffering and cruelty. And I'm thinking if um, I were going to write a play, I wouldn't write the extremes in. I think you could still have disappointment and challenge. This is me, pers my personal view. Disappointment, challenge. Um, it's suffering. For me, suffering is, you know, it's overcast all day. <laughs> You know, that's I enough know. suffering. You have that's the others. Suffering. I know I'm looking at it right so now. I just wonder like, why, why am I in a play that is so extreme? Like talk about extreme sports. This is over what I, I'm like, higher self, what are you thinking? Um, <laughs> You're a healer but, by nature. Like, and I don't know if I've ever told you that, but I can feel you, you know, when you, when you're, when, when you're someone capable of what you have, and you have your empathy, your, you have empathy and you have love for people that are suffering. You make people feel better. And so what I would say is how can you learn to, to help people, but not take it on? Mm -hmm. it right. Sure. And it's taken me years to do that because I can go, you've seen me work. There'll be one person that has had, you know, there was a murder in a family and another person just lost their husband and another person just lost their brother. And if I took all of that on, I wouldn't be a good medium. And I'm not, it's not about being good or bad. It's just to be efficient with what I do for work. I, like I said earlier, I have to get in and get out. Now, is there times where I go home and I cry? Yes. But there's a reason why mediums don't remember the things that come through them. It would be mm. devastating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I, I am wondering, um, I've heard this before and I don't know if you've had this experience, but spirits can impersonate so they can manifest as like someone might come through as uncle Joe and then, you know, or, or an angel for that matter. And, but yet after further investigation, it's revealed that no, I'm not. I I was I was impersonating or an ET coming through as a you know Uncle Joe, and no, I'm actually ET so and so. Hmm. Have you ever heard of this kind of thing before? So I'll give you a different take on that. Um, a lot of times when I'm, when I'm looking at one spirit because they don't talk like this, they project their thoughts. So nobody talks like this. Nobody talks like this when you're sleeping. So you might have, you might have a situation where you see somebody in your sleep, but nobody ever talks like that in your sleep. Right. There's no, there's, so there's a reason why I'm saying that. So I might be looking at one spirit and another spirit that's next to him might be projecting their thoughts. So I have to figure out who's, who's who, and that's how I have to work it out now do. And so that might be what you're saying. They might think that that's that person or that person changes, but it just might be that there's, they're right there next to them. And one's projecting their thoughts, whereas the other one's not. Okay. okay, so it's not your experience. I just know because I've interviewed people, um, several near-death experiencers, and there's the occasional, oh, I met so-and-so on the other side, and then they re actually they weren't my it's, aunt. That is, that's different because they come in to have you, give you a soft landing. 
So they'll, they'll come in as something that you recognize. So they'll cut like, so I understand what they're saying and then they might turn into something else, but I believe that they'll just have that other person come in. You know, do you know what I'm saying? So they'll have a, they'll, because if you, if you're afraid, like for an ET to show up, that might freak you out and you're already in a place where you're freaking out. So if you, I call it the soft landing. So there's a lot of stuff like that that happens if you go to the other side. Yes. Okay. Just get them to come in. Yeah, my part of my concern was deception. Is there, do, can we run into deception on the other side when we cross over? Do we need to be discerning and use protections like we do here? I think, I don't think so. I think there's too many people that, Think about this. You go over to this other side, you have animals that are going to be waiting for you. They're already going to be there. You have, you're going to have um, family. You're going to have soul groups that you, you'll recognize, but you didn't know that you had that were here. You'll have, there's just no, I can't imagine unless that person was too afraid to die and had to have a soft landing in some other way, or was, um, was an atheist. Cause that can also make it difficult at first. Um, Dr. Evan Alexander has a perfect proof of heaven. That's a great book because he had something similar that you've been. Discussing. Yes, yes. He's on our channel too, interview here. Okay. I interviewed him. Yeah, he's great. Great. He's a wonderful human being. I've spoken to him a few times. But he um, but so I think that I think that there's different versions. I just don't know it. That's all. I don't think yeah. that you in my it, I don't feel that you have to have protection. I've only seen nothing but incredible love even with people that have killed themselves you know the love that comes through to get them i just i haven't seen the other so that's just my awareness it doesn't mean it doesn't exist i just haven't seen it yeah and i we're getting really close to being out of time because i know you have another appointment um so you mentioned suicide and We've mentioned, well, you know, murderers, not that those would be in the same category, but some religions would believe, oh, if you take your life, then you're going to go to hell. So what are your thoughts about hell? You, and how would you describe where someone who's in a really negative mental space, what would happen to them after they cross over? So I had, so I had a father whose son committed suicide because he was schizophrenic. And he was, you know, he lives in Texas, he's in the Bible Belt, you know, he grew up believing that if you commit suicide, you're going to hell, that kind of thing. And so he read the Bible, he studied it. There's not one thing in the Bible that says that if you commit suicide, you go to hell. Not one thing in the whole Bible says that. That's all man-made. That being said, I believe there's nobody that's like, that I've seen commit suicide has been in the right mind to begin with you're not going to be punished for that you're not it's just not a thing and when you go over there yes are you they're more worried about our loved ones here nine out of ten times they couldn't believe it happened that it actually worked or it did like i've had you know it's just from my experience you're you, hell there was more hell here for them than there is over there i haven't seen hell over there at all I just haven't. I've only seen their state of mind here. And when they leave, they're so apologetic to the people that they left the way that they did. They know that they're going to spend all the time trying to make up for that. But that, you know, but the hell that they had was here and it was in their hearts. They just, they couldn't, a lot of times they just couldn't be in their bodies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? Well, um, before we run out of time, I want to make sure we check in on whatever current projects you're working on and how the listeners can connect with you. And I'll put all of your links in the video description. Okay. Um, I have um, I have a podcast where we teach people. How, I love your podcast. Thank you. By the way, thank you, Julie, for having me on. Um, I have a podcast I've been doing with Richard Martini. He's uh, we've been we've been seeing each other once a week for the last eight years. And so the last two years, COVID put, he's written four books that we've, that, um, about this work, about what we do, which is pretty, to help people kind of connect on their own. And then to connect with me, um, my website, if you, you know, jenniferschafer.com, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-S-H-A-F-F-E-R.com. I do events at Uncorked in Manhattan. 
um, Manhattan Beach and Hermosa Beach, but I also do them for, I've been doing a lot of events everywhere, which is fun for me. It's a lot of fun for me. Um, and then I have a private practice here, right here in Manhattan Beach, but you don't have to be here or live here to come see me. You know, I love it when I get somebody that wants to just do the phone, like have a phone call. I'm like, old school, this is amazing. <laughs> you know, because people want to see, they just want to, it's just, you know, it makes, I try to make this as tangible as possible. I try. Well, very good. And just before we close out, do you have any other words, anything on your heart, uh, last words to share with the listeners? I guess my animal. So animals are very, very important. They are sentient beings. They come in all the time to my readings. I can't tell you, even the living ones do. They tell me what's going on with the house or they tell me what's going It's so spectacular. Like know that your fur babies, if you don't have regular, you know, children or whatever, know that your fur babies are just as important and they love you so much and that there is an afterlife where you get to reunite with them and you get to feel them and, and nobody dies. I've never seen anyone dying alone ever. And so I know a lot of people feel alone, but I promise you there's so many people on the other side between angels and your guides and that are there with you, with your struggle, with whatever you're going through. And the last thing is get outside your head. So if you're thinking about something or if you have this loop, like call a friend, just, you know, call a friend old school instead of like texting <laughs> and just try to understand what energy is yours and what's not yours. That's what can really pull you down. So other than that, just love and love more. <laughs> All right. I'll leave that with you. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, so much for taking this time with us. I really appreciate you. Can't wait to and see and thank you to everyone who is watching or listening. This has been Julie McVeigh with Unordinary Made, uh, Made Ordinary. I hope you'll join us next time for another fascinating interview. Um, if you did enjoy this, please give it a thumbs up. And if you like this type of content, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon so you are alerted to future videos and interviews. And I hope you are having a fantastic day or evening, wherever you are on the planet or off the planet. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.